This lecture is presented by John Moffat of Open Tuition. For other free lectures, visit opentuition.com. Let's get on with number 11. What order should the products be manufactured in to ensure that profit is maximised? A company here, they've got three products using different amounts of the same grade of labour, which is in short supply. The budgeted data relates to the products, so P1, P2, P3. And we've got there the costings per unit, the selling price, and then materials, labour, variable overhead, six overhead, the profit per unit. Well, this is a key factor question. It's in the same chapter as throughput accounting. Uh, in order to decide, <coughs> excuse me, which is the best product, which is the second best, and so on, we need to look at the contribution per hour of the limited resource. And so what are the contributions, first of all? P1, P2, P3. Uh, the contribution per unit. Now, the selling price has variable costs or faster. Uh, it's the profit before fixed overheads. So for P1, the profit is 44, fixed overheads are 6. The contribution must be 50 per unit. Uh, for P2, 51 profit plus 9 fixed overheads. Profit before fixed overheads, the contribution must be 60 per unit. And for P3, 26 plus 12 is what? 38. To make the best use of the uh, limited labour, we need the contribution per hour. So what are the labour hours per unit? Uh, labour, if you look back, is $10 per hour. So product P1, the cost is $10. It must be one hour of labour. P2 is $20. Well, at $10 an hour, it must be two hours. And P3, $11 a unit. At $10 an hour, it must be 1.1 hours. And so the contribution per hour divide through uh, for P1, $50 divided by 1 is 50. For P2, $60 over 2 is 30. And for P3, 38 over 1.1. And I need my calculator. 38 over 1.1 is 34.545, whatever. It says, what order should we be manufactured in? Well, you always go for the one giving the greatest contribution per hour. So P1 is best. You would make as many as you could of P1. But once you'd reach maximum demand, if you'd still hours left, you'd go to the next best, which is P3. And once you'd exhausted that, you'd go to the next best, which is P2. So there's the order. How much P1? P1 is first. P2 is third. Third, P3 is second, so the answer is C. Good. Number 12. Which of, another of these, which of the above statements is or are correct? The following statements have been made about life cycle costing. Number one, it focuses on the short term by identifying costs at the beginning of a product's life cycle. No, we don't get costs at the beginning, but we get costs throughout the life of the um, product. We don't just look at the short term. Uh, what about two? It identifies all costs which arise in relation to the product each year and then calculates the product's profitability on an annual basis. No. No, if you remember, product is very likely to be loss-making at the beginning, but that would be worthwhile if it was profit-making later. With life cycle, we look at the whole life of the product, not just year by year. Number three. Yeah, incidentally, look at the choices. You know, if you ever got stuck, I'm going to carry on working through it, but if you get stuck in the exam, just have a quick look. 
if you're happy that one and two are not right, the answer can't be A, one and three. It can't be C, one and four. And it can't be D, which is two only. So in fact, the answer has to be B, whether you understand the other two statements or you don't. But anyway, let's check. Three, it accumulates a product's costs over its whole lifetime and works out the overall profitability. Yes, that's what I said a few minutes ago. That is true. And finally, four. It allocates costs to each stage of the life cycle and writes them off at the end of each stage. Well, I don't want to waste time wondering what that means, but the answer is no, we don't keep writing off costs at the end of each stage. So the answer is three only, the answer is B. Number 13, which of the above statements is true again. And here's another one which is uh, quite a lot to read. I think it turns out to be easy enough, but, um, you know, do what I said before, jump around, look for the very short ones, get them out of the way first, and then spend more time on those that are harder or are longer. A company's sales and cost of sales figures have remained unchanged for the last two years. The following information has been noted. So we got there for two years. First column appreciated is this year, May 2015. The other column is last year, 2014. The inventory turnover period, receivables payment period, receivables, uh, sorry, payables payment period, receivables payment period, current ratio, quick ratio. The following statements have been made. Customers are taking longer to pay, and this may have contributed to the line in the uh, decline in the current ratio. Well, the current ratio has gone down. Are they taking longer to pay? The payment period was 68 days. This year, it's 60 days, so in fact, they're paying faster. Number one is certainly therefore not true. What about number two? Inventory levels have decreased, and this may have contributed to the decline in the company's quick ratio. Well, I'm not even going to bother looking to see if inventory levels have decreased or not. The quick ratio ignores inventory. And so, uh, well, if inventory levels have gone up or down, wouldn't affect the quick ratio at all. Out of interest, have inventory levels uh, decreased? No. The turnover period, they were buying inventory every 38 days. Now they're buying it every 45 days. So it looks to me as though inventory levels have gone up, but regardless, it doesn't affect the quick ratio, so neither statement is true. The answer is D. Number 14. What is the sales price planning variance? Uh, CAFCO budgeted to sell 10,000 units of a product at a budgeted selling price of forty, uh, sorry, of $5 a unit. That's the budget price. The actual sales volumes were as budgeted, but the actual price was only $4. So overall, there's an adverse price variance. However, it's because a competitor launched a similar product at the same time, we'd be unaware of this. And had we known, we'd have revised the expected selling price to $3.80, the price of the competitor's product. Well, the planning variance, we originally budgeted on $5. Had we known this information, we would have revised the budget. Uh, we'd have budgeted on a selling price of only $3.80. So the planning variance would be 120 per unit. Applied to the actual sales, where well, the actual sales were as budget, which was 10,000. So um, the planning variance, or the price planning variance, would be what, 120, 10,000? It would be 12,000. And because we'd be revising the price downwards, lower price would mean less profit, it would be adverse. 12,000 adverse, yes, the answer is A. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Next one. 15. Oh, another variance question. What is the total sales quantity contribution variance for the period? Now, um, several ways you can get the same answer. I'll do it one way. You do it different ways. Try to get the same answer, obviously. That's fine. But it's the sales quantity contribution variance. So for sales quantity, we're not interested in any changes in the selling price or in the costs for that matter. We just want to know if they sold in total more units or less units, that on its own would have resulted in more profit or less profit. Well, how much profit were they originally budgeting on? Or contribution, I beg your pardon. Uh, product A, 15,840 units at a contribution of 12 a unit is what? 190,080. Product B, they were budgeting on 10,560 units. 24 selling price, cost 11, so a contribution of 13. Uh, 137280. And so they were budgeting on selling a total of 26,400 units and getting a total contribution of 327,360. So that was the budget. That's how much profit they should have made. Well, for the sales quantity contribution variance, we look at how many in total they actually sold. And assuming everything else has stayed the same, how much extra or lower contribution would have resulted. So the actual total sales It was 14,200 of A, 12,500 of B is 26,700 units. Uh, and if everything else had been the same, if we'd have kept the same selling price, if we'd have kept the same mix, if we'd have mixed in the same ratio, then those units should have been giving the same average profit per unit. So what I would do is say, well, how many extra units did we sell? Uh, 26,700, we sold 300 extra. And if we'd kept the same selling price, the same mix, each unit would have generated a contribution on budget 327,360 for 26,400 units. That is the average contribution per unit if we get the same mix, the same price. And so selling an extra 300, that on its own would have generated as an extra 3,720. And because in total sales are higher, extra sales would mean more profit, it's favorable. The answer is A. Now I say again, you can get the same answer several ways. Um, I have a feeling from memory uh, that the examiner's own answer, they obviously got the same answer, but in a, uh, they set it out differently. It doesn't matter. Whatever you find easiest to remember and um, the fastest. Okay, only uh, five left. So let's have a go with number 16. Which of the above reasons could have caused the difference between the expected rate of learning and the actual rate of learning? What do they say? A company predicted that the learning rate for production of a new product would be 80%. So the expected learning rate is 80%. The actual learning rate was 75%. Now, do remember that with learning, 
it's sort of the opposite from what you'd expect. In that the lower the learning rate, the faster the learning. Now make sure you remember that, but don't just learn it as a rule, make sure you're clear why. You know, if the learning rate is 100%, they, they never get any faster, there's no learning at all. The lower the learning rate, the faster the learning, the faster and faster the working. So here, the actual is lower than the expected rate, there is therefore faster learning. So let's look through the, 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 the following possible reasons. The number of new employees recruited was lower than expected. It's a nice question, this. If you employ new, new people, the more new people you employ, the lower that you'd expect the learning to be, because they have to start again. You know, if you keep the existing staff, they're going to carry on learning. Well, here, they recruited fewer than expected, and so they would expect faster learning. That is a possible reason. Number two, unexpected problems with production. If there were problems with production, that would slow things down. We wouldn't have faster learning, there'd be slower learning, so it's not two. Number three, Unexpected changes to health and safety laws meant the company had to increase the number of breaks during production for employees. Well, if employees are having more breaks, they're going to take longer. Uh, they're not going to be faster. And so, in fact, the only one of those that could have caused the difference is uh, number one. So the answer is C. Uh, number 17, when activity-based costing is used for environmental accounting, which statement is correct for environment-related costs and environment-driven costs? Well, again, very much a definition one, but I'll do it in reverse order. Environment-driven costs... They're costs that we're forced to incur, but are forced on us by the outside environment. Forced from outside. So, for instance, uh, electricity. If electricity costs go up, we've no control. It's forced on us uh, by the environment. Global warming. If, as a result of global warming, we ended up having to spend more on electricity. Again, it's forced on us from outside. It's environmental driven. Whereas environmentally related costs, they're environmental costs, but they're under our control. So, for instance, waste. We control how much waste we have in our process. It's an environmental cost, but it's something we control. We can, can hope uh, to reduce uh, the degree of waste. So there's the difference. The weather getting warmer or colder is outside our control, but it means we incur costs. Things like waste are under our control. Uh, and again, resulting costs. So, which of these makes sense? Environment-related costs, the so ones we can control, can be attributed to joint cost centres. Environment-driven costs, ones we don't control, can't be. Well, that is true. The answer is, in fact, A. I'll have a quick run through the others, but it is A. Um, costs that are forced from outside, we can't attribute um, to specific uh, to joint cost centres. Environment driven costs can be attributed. We just said they can't. Environment related costs can't be. No, that's the opposite. It's not B. Both can be attributed to joint cost centres. No, only environment related costs. Neither can be. Well, again, the answer is A. 
Now that's one of those, well, A, you've either learned and you haven't, and B, it's very easy, even if you know the truth, just sort of misread, they all look very similar. If you are having problems, then for heaven's sake, just guess. There's no point in sitting staring at it for 20 minutes. Uh, I guess you, you, know, you must have in 20 answers, even if five, six of them are guessed because you got stuck or you ran out of time. Uh, nobody knows in the exam whether it was a guess or whether you got it right for the right reasons. The computer marks it two marks, zero. You must answer 20 questions. Anyway, back to where we are, 18. Which of the following statements is or are correct? The following statements have been made about the materials mix variants for a company manufacturing different products using the same type of material. Number one, the mix variants can be take, can be calculated by taking the difference between the actual quantity, that standard mix, and the actual quantity at actual mix, so, so far so good, and multiplying by the actual cost per kilo. No. No, the first bit's true, but for the mixed variances, we only look at changes in one thing at a time. Uh, we would multiply by the standard cost per kilo, not the actual. So one isn't true. Number two... The mix variance arises because there is a difference between what the input should have been for the output achieved and the actual output. No, no, that's describing the yield variance. For the mix variance, we take what actually went in, the actual quantity, and compare our mix with standard mix. You know, number one was correct apart from um, costing it out at actual cost per kilo. So, in fact, now the statement's true, the answer's A. Almost there, number 19. Ooh, the very first question was residual income here. What's the expected return on investment of the division for the year based on average capital employed? At the start of the year, a division has non-current assets of 4 million. We make no assets at disposals, the depreciation at 10% per annum on all non-current assets held at the end of the year. Working capital, net current assets. Um, it's 0.5 million at the start, but it's expected to increase by 20% by the end of the year. The budget profit after depreciation is 1.2 million. What's the expected return on investment based on the average capital employed? Well, the return on investment, uh, we take the profit, 1.2 million, as a percentage of the average, because it tells us, capital employed. So what is the average capital employed uh, during the year? And then I'll go back and finish it off. At the start of the year, what's the total assets, the capital employed? The non-current assets of 4 million. And in addition, the net current assets working capital of 0.5 million. And so total assets 4.5, total net assets 4.5 million. At the end of the year, it will have changed. Um, first of all, the non-current assets, there's depreciation. So uh, it was 4 million. If we're depreciating by 10% a year, um, they'll have fallen to, the non current assets will fall to 3.6 million. Working capital, it was 0.5 at the start, is expected to increase by 20%. Well, 20% of 0.5 is 0.1. So the working capital goes to uh, 0.6 million. So the um, total net assets would be what? 4.2 million at the end of the year. The average therefore, 
4.5 plus 4.2 over 2 for the average is 8.7 divided by 2 is 4.35. And therefore, what is the return on capital employed? Now, if I'm right, I get 0.2759 or 27.59% which is A. Great. One left, and then we've cracked section A. Number 20. The following statements have been made in relate. Oh, sorry. Which of the above statements is or are true, are correct? The following statements have been made in, in relation to concept selling in throughput accounting. Number one. Inventory levels should be kept to a minimum. Yes, that's a standard bit about uh, throughput accounting. It does assume that we keep inventory uh, levels as low as possible, ideally, uh, to be just in time. Number two, all machines within a factory should be 100% efficient with no idle time. No, not all machines. With throughput accounting, it's the bottleneck machine which we need to be 100% um, efficient. Um, it's that that slows everything else down. The others will have idle time. So it's not all machines, it's the bottleneck one. That's not true. So the answer is A, one only. And there we are, there's section A. Um, I've recorded answers to section B. Uh, they'll be uploaded separately.